Welcome to The Craft. I'm your host, Mae Globus. This podcast is a collection of intimate conversations on artistry, mastery, and life with talented, passionately curious creatives and entrepreneurs. Most are dear friends, some are those I've admired from afar. I hope you enjoy these conversations, this exploration of the humanity that connects all of us as much as I do having them. Thank you for being here and for listening. Matt Corker and Chad Clark have a strength of bond that is undeniable. Their love feels deep and true. Matt spent years in people and leadership development at Lululemon and the Corker Collective, and is now the COO of global fashion brand Smash & Tess. Chad spent decades in retail and hospitality, getting his retail start at Banana Republic and Holt Renfrew, before transitioning into restaurants as maitre d' and eventually director of operations at the Hawksworth Restaurant Group. Chad was born in Michigan and raised in Montreal. His mother is Filipino and his father is Caucasian, and both were educators. He was a resilient teen who taught himself to deal with difficult situations at a young age, and that ability to handle hard situations with grace is a talent he brought to his career. Matt grew up on the East Coast in Aurora, Ontario. His parents divorced when he was 10, and around the same time, he was deep into musical theater as a child, indulging in his love for singing and performing. He also got involved in leadership development at 13, a passion that he transformed into a fulfilling career down the line. In this conversation, we explore both their different upbringings and stories of coming out to family and friends, the way their respective careers unfolded, what made Chad successful at running a restaurant floor, the future of the restaurant industry, Matt's experience in people development, and what it taught him about humans and company culture, what it means to be courageously creative how they became fathers to their son, and the surrogacy journey, and more. Please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with the fascinating and fun Chad Clark and Matt Corker, two beautiful souls who found one another. Matt Corker, Chad Clark, welcome to The Craft. Ah, it's so good to be here. Thank you for having us. Yes, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to, A, see you after what I feel like is a couple of years. Yeah. And uh, to dive into your stories, because we've intersected over the years in various different ways. Um, me and you, Chad, from restaurant industry, Bonita yes. Days. Yep. This is the first time. Mm-hmm. In Talksworth and other ways. And then Matt, we formally met a couple years ago through a mutual friend. Yeah. 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 It was one of those moments of like, I've only heard great things about you. Totally. And now I get to meet you in person. Yes. And we played Settlers of Catan. That was how we bonded, board games. <laughs> board games, I love it. You've got to do it that way. you got to do it that way. Um, and then do, do you remember we went to House of Dosa as oh, well yeah. and had that dinner? I totally that was remember so House of Dosa. fun. Mm-hmm. We actually passed by there the other day. Yeah. And I was like, babe, we should go there. And he's like, we have. <laughs> yeah. And that was that night. <laughs> that was that May night. And Zach. Yeah. 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 It was so good. So fun. I knew that day I was like, oh, I need to spend more time with these two. <laughs> and then a pandemic happened. And then that happened. And so, yeah. but here we are. <laughs> Reunited um, once again. Oh, I love it. Um, <laughs> I'd love to rewind the clock and go back to your childhoods. So, Chad, you mm-hmm. were born in the States. You were born in Michigan. Born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, of all places. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father's from Michigan. Yeah. And uh, from a town called Benton Harbor. Yeah. It's a town his mother's family founded. Yeah. Wasn't the town named after your family? Or? Yeah, the Phil Strip family. Yeah. Uh, so it goes back from when mm-hmm. they came over from Denmark. Yeah. And my father joined the military and got stationed in the Philippines after his first divorce, well, his only divorce. He he divorced his first wife. And then my mother, who was being raised in Hawaii by her Filipino parents, were worried that she was going to marry a big American. So Mm. they sent her back to the Philippines to go find a Filipino husband. And she went to the American naval base and met my dad. Wow. Yeah. And then came back to the States and that's where I happened. Mm -hmm. And shortly after I was born, my dad got a job teaching at McGill. So I was actually raised originally in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And because we were immigrants, we had to learn French, which turned out to be a huge asset actually, being raised completely in French. Um, My mom has recordings of my brothers and I 
uh, and we would just speak in French. Oh, no way. Yeah. And so we had a rule that we had to speak English at the dinner table because my parents couldn't understand us. <laughs> But we left Montreal when I was eight in the like the mass Anglo exodus, and my dad got a job teaching at UBC, mm. and that was in '87. Yeah, what are your parents like? What's mom like? What's dad like? <sighs> <laughs> I love these questions. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have amazing parents. You know, like my mother, obviously growing up gay, and I was one of those kids where you kind of just knew. Mm -hmm. Right. There, no, there, no one was surprised when I came out. Um, and despite what was going on in the world and their upbringings, my mom is extremely Catholic. Um, no matter what was going on in their worlds, they allowed me to be raised in a way that never made me feel like I ever had to be ashamed of anything that I was. Mm -hmm. And... I have the utmost respect. You know, they did it very differently than I'm doing it today, for sure. Uh, but they're both educators. My mom was an early childhood educator. So she was like K123 and taught for like 35 years in the Catholic school system. Uh, and then my dad, university professor. So like we had a household where, you know, education was really important. And mm. um, knowledge exchange, I'm sure, was. Yeah. Huge. So I just didn't do any of that. Mm. And got a degree in music mm. uh, but my parents have it's funny you know you hear stories of kids coming out and getting kicked out of their homes and really struggling to tell their parents and their families and you know they find solace in their friends at school and I really had the the opposite experience in that I was so grounded at home like I never had to question anything that I was at home uh, and school was actually where it was tough. And I, um, you know, the typical, like, got beat up by the football players and got made fun of and a lot of bullying going on the whole way through, pretty much. Uh, but I actually hid it from my parents because I didn't, w I knew they would get upset and I knew that they would get involved. Mm. Um, one year, I got beat up right before we left for our family vacation. And my ribs were all bruised and we were in Hawaii visiting family and I wouldn't take my shirt off. And I was like, what's going on? And I was like, oh, I just got hurt. And then, you know, I ultimately kind of told them that I kind of got beat up. And like all teenagers, I was like, don't you dare say mm -hmm. anything like mm -hmm. I will handle this, you know, and it broke their hearts to know that I was going through all this stuff. But they respected the fact that, you know, I said I would handle it. Mm. And my mom, she laughs because she says, like, that I was never a little boy. She was, you were just this old man from You're the get-go. <laughs> uh, the one story that she always tells me was that when we, my brother and I went to a school that was relatively close by uh, in Montreal. But in case of emergency, they taught us how to walk home. And so fast forward my mom had gotten into a car accident and there was after school care at this school, but my mom was so late and I somehow, I was five and my brother was barely four and I somehow convinced the caretakers to let us leave mm. and I walked my brother and I home. I went to the neighbors because I knew they had a spare key to our house. I let ourselves into the house, gave my brother a snack, put him in front of the TV and I sat on the front stairs waiting for my mom to come home. And I like my mom was like, I got scolded by my five-year-old for not picking us up. You knew how to handle things I, at a very you know. young age. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, my relationship has always been, I, I never really went through a phase where I was like, I feel like I was parented. My parents always just like really did just love and support everything that I was doing. They really yeah. had to do all the parenting with my brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like you were just allowed to be you in a lot of ways. It, yeah, yeah. You know, um, and to, you know, to my parents' credit, you know, even when I was coming out, because I came out early for those days, the first time I told them I was in the 10th grade. The reason I say the first time is because I kind of like 
went in and out of the closet, mm-hmm. <laughs> more so for my own sake than anybody else's. But I was sitting at the dinner table with my parents. I was like, this is the moment. I started to get super emotional and I was crying. And I was like, I have something to tell you. And my dad kind of just looked. He's like, we know you're gay. It's okay. Mm. And I was like, he's like, you can stop crying. You don't have to be super dramatic about it. Was that a relief for <laughs> you? I was like, just... I was pissed. I wanted my oh. moment. I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, you should probably go downstairs and tell your brother. I was like, go downstairs and tell my brother. And so... I was kind of like in shock at how unmomentous it was. Mm. And I remember I go downstairs, my brother's like all, you know, watching TV. And I came downstairs and without even like starting, I was like, Sean, and he goes, dude, I know you're gay. And like, that was the, that was it. That was it. So I really didn't get to like, it was just a non thing. Mm. which I think was so beautiful about it. Mm -hmm. I was just allowed to be, but what I, you know, what I learned too is that I would often on two occasions specifically, I could hear my mom crying in her bedroom and I'd ask my dad, I'm like, what's going on with mom? And she, he's like, you know, she's so Catholic and the Mm. Catholic church is telling her that she needs to condemn her son Mm. and she won't do it. And so she's, she's such the perfect example of, of taking the institution um, of religion out of her spirituality. Mm. And even though Catholicism is highly problematic, it's, it's all she knows. And I always said, do not choose me over the church. You can have us both. And she learned, you know, she doesn't ask us to go to mass and she knows her boundaries. Um, But I would never, I have such profound respect of how she's managed to find a place where she can love her kids for all that they are and also have like an extraordinarily devout Catholic practice in her life. Yeah. And then my dad just goes along for the ride. (laughs) He just does what he's told. Yeah. She's found that she's found that balance. That is really beautiful. Mm, I, cause I very seldom would I really say that I could, I've seen, a really perfect example of what Catholicism should look like. Yeah, yeah. But I would say that if my, if I had to choose one, my mom is probably one of the examples that I would lean on mm-hmm. because obviously having being a gay family, there isn't a lot of, a lot of support in religion in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wouldn't advocate for it, but she is the only person that really tests that opinion of mine. Mm. Wow. I like I think that's I mean to have that unshakable love from parents that's that's so so important. It to it know gave that me it's a there. Pla- yeah, it gave me a platform that I just took the abuse in high school mm-hmm. and I remember thinking to myself, I'd get beat up, I'd get you know, I used to run for student council every year mm-hmm. and you know, you put posters all over the school for a week and mm-hmm. I would have to make three or four times more posters than everybody else because they would get defaced every day. Oh my gosh. One year, the guy who got elected to be president, his campaign slogan was don't vote for the fag. Who was me? Oh, and this is what I was like. And I would just, you know, I'm so sorry. People. Would, well, it was what it was. Yeah, but what's amazing tell. is mm. that as a kid, I would be like, this is their problem, not mine. Mm. I don't know where. And I have to attribute it to my parents because I don't know where else I would have gotten the belief that there isn't anything wrong with me, it's all you. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I suppose you also develop this thick skin as well that can allow you to navigate difficult situations. Yeah, in, and you know, throughout my, life. Yeah, and and to my father's credit, he, you know, I was active in volleyball and the French community, and there was this one teacher who was also a counselor. He actually reached out to this counselor and was like, listen, my teenage son is not going to want to talk to me about anything. So he asked her to reach out to me and to create a bond, which she did. She actually gave me a key to her office Mm. that I was when it got to be too much or when I needed a safe space that I was like allowed to use her office myself. And she actually got me through a lot of the tough, tough stuff at high school. 
But what I didn't know was that it was all for my, my dad's doing. Wow. And so it's it's such a unique story in that I don't have this, you know, dramatic, tragic upbringing in regards to my coming out. It was, yeah. it was like the least of my worries. Right. Very supported in that aspect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you were very musical back then as well? Like, ish. Mm. Reluctantly so. Reluctantly? Like, well, because I just... I just, I started singing in mass, obviously. Mm-hmm. And I was basically like strong armed into doing like service singing, mm-hmm. like doing the, the canter. Choir at the church, yeah. Yeah. And so I became like this Catholic choir junkie and was, did the circuit. I was so involved in the Catholic church. Mm. I love that there's a circuit for the Catholic <laughs> singers. Well, well, because we, we had this, we, found um we put together like a catholic youth Mm. choir called a joyful noise and uh we were really good we had a lot of really great musicians and so we got asked often invited to do masses around the city around Mm. the lower mainland okay you know yeah and then you eventually took your degree in music yeah i mean that also like i've been dragged kicking and screaming the whole way through Mm. um because who I was never really passionate about being a musician per se, Mm. because I was like, I need to get a real job. I need to go to school. And I went to UBC, got into arts one and was doing like a normal arts degree with, I was like, maybe I'll go into business. I lasted one semester and it was actually my dad because he worked at UBC. And so we'd meet for lunch every week and I hated it. Like just wasn't for me. And at that time I was, living in kits Mm -hmm. because I was just happy to stay at home. And my mother being a good Filipino mother was like, he's going to live at home until he gets married. (laughs) But um, I really started to like develop into my uh, persona, my sexuality, if you will. And like, I, I felt maybe too comfortable. So I started like bringing boys home to my parents' house. And so one day my dad was like, you know what? You need to go be gay. (laughs) <laughs> somewhere else so they rented me my first apartment in kits because he's like i just think this is important for your development <laughs> yes and i was like but you guys are so comfortable and he's like we know but we, there's we just don't need to be here for all of it <laughs> there's so, some things that are better that yeah we don't you know, know. <laughs> and but like that goes to like and i didn't even think twice i was so comfortable like bringing the most random boys back to my parents house uh, that I can only imagine what it looked like. I was 18. Mm. And I think back on it and I want to cringe. Uh, that was the phase you oh were in. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. so, you know, I was doing the thing and I was singing. I had a singing teacher and she was the one who actually convinced my parents. One of my best friends got into the opera program at U of T. Mm. And she was like, get out of what you're doing and just come sing. And so... You did. That's what I did. Oh, and I lived so in Toronto cool. for five years. Mm, okay. Or I did my degree. I see. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, uh, okay, let's put a pin on that because I want to get to Matt because I know, Matt, you told me that you had spent a chapter in Toronto. So I'm wondering if this is, is this where you two met? No. Not oh, even close. Not even close. Okay. I, was a, I was a little baby when I was living in Ontario. Oh, I mean, okay. okay. Oh, say, I thought you were going to say. When I met I'm not you. that much older than that. <laughs> I'm a little older, but I'm not that much older. Okay, we'll put a pin in the me- the meeting story. But <laughs> um, Matt, you grew up on the East Coast, Aurora, yeah, Aurora, right? Aurora, Ontario. Mm-hmm. So just north of yeah. Toronto. Yeah. Um, and I, interestingly enough, probably had the exact opposite story of Chad growing up. Mm. Um, I had an incredible high school experience. I loved. My friends, I was involved. I actually got involved in leadership development conferences and organizing leadership development opportunities for student leaders across Ontario as like a true nerd (laughs) Um, when I was about 13 or so. Started young. Started young. And it was probably a really game-changing experience because it created a level of safety and community that I experienced not only within my own school, but also... Uh, beyond into other school districts in Mm -hmm. Ontario and it really showed me the power of community and it showed me the power 
of young people, to be honest, mm-hmm. and really, um, and I continue to see it to this day in that we sometimes overlook the potential of the youth. We think that they're our future. And I was like, no, they're like doing cool stuff right now mm-hmm. um, and faced with different challenges. Anyway, I'll, I digress. Um, my experience growing up in Ontario, um, my parents divorced when I was 10. And at the time, I was actually performing in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat with Donny Osmond. No <laughs> In his way. goodbye tour <laughs> in Toronto. <laughs> um, and I was in the kids' choir. And I loved performing. I was involved in musical theater um, ever since, I want to say grade three, maybe? Mm-hmm. Um, grade, yeah, um, maybe even younger. And I just loved it. But I do remember my first audition. Um, and I had prepared... I can't even remember. I want to say it was like a Disney song of some sort. And I walked into that audition and they were like, did you have anything prepared to sing? And I was like, no. (laughs) It was like this awkward silence. They're like, do you want to sing happy birthday? And I was like, (laughs) okay. And I had this really awful audition. No. Um, But then when I got comfortable, like they were like, we'll give you like person two. (laughs) Like that was my title in the program. And when I got comfortable and learned how to dance and sing, I was like, oh, this is so fun. They're like, you can actually, like, you're actually good. You should audition differently next time. And so I was really involved in theater. So at the time, jumping ahead into Joseph, um, my entire grade five year was pretty much performing. Mm. Um, I didn't really go to school very much uh, during that year. And, you know, one night my mom would pick me up from the stage door the next night, my dad would carpool like us, me and some of the choir members home. And I never really gave it any thought necessarily. Um, and then things just started feeling a little bit more awkward. We went into like family therapy and I was like, this is this is weird. Like what's happening mm. here? And s- s- started to realize that there were cracks in the family. And, mm. um, and, and so my parents got divorced and I was kind of, uh, a, a bystander in the experience and so my experience of, of the divorce was really interesting because th- I then got to see both of my parents kind of like try to win me over mm. and they played roles in that they I think they were just scared that they would lose me or that you know like I was something that would be negotiated mm. in the divorce And so I actually got a lot of leeway. Like I felt like I was able to get away with a lot um, because they wanted to make sure that like I still loved them and like I still thought highly of them. And so I was able to like party and go out and whatnot. And the rule was like if I got good grades, I could, you know, go have a job or go hang out with friends later at night. I didn't have a curfew and all these things. And I look back and I was like, I think that (laughs) you just like didn't want me to hate you to hate you yeah Yeah. there's that parent guilt from totally and I I look back and I was like man they that must have been such a hard time Mm. for them um to feel like you know they may have been losing assets and losing status or like changing jobs and houses and all the things that came with that experience for them and to feel like their kid was also on the table Mm. of that negotiation Mm -hmm. um just something that I've learned to have a lot of compassion around um, and when I was a kid, I was like, get me the F out of here. Like, this is not a, an experience where I would say, you know, Chad talks about feeling so able to be himself at home. And I was like, I, if I want to be myself, I got to move. Mm. So that's when I uh, looked at the furthest possible <laughs> place to move within Canada. Yes. Um, and so I looked at UBC to go to university. So I went to UBC uh, for all four years of my degree, mm-hmm. and like Chad, I was able to withstand yeah. <laughs> the experience, yeah. and I loved it. I, and I have never looked back. Mm. So Vancouver quickly became home. Mm. And then there was a chapter in Toronto as well. Just, 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 li- just um, working mm. as a kid in Toronto. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, you were saying you were around eighteen, right, when you were in Toronto? No, I was like ten. Oh, ten. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so aside from, you know, the 
divorce of your parents. What were, what were your parents like as people? As people? Well, it's so interesting because both of them were very much in the working world, and they actually worked at Kodak together. If you remember mm, way yes, back when yeah. Kodak was a booming industry mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than trying to struggle yeah. making it through. Um, and so they met at work. And so my when I think back to who my parents were was my dad was the classic blue suit software salesman. He loved closing a deal. He had the gift of the gab. He loved to talk to strangers. He would sell you on anything. Mm -hmm. um, his favorite line was, here's a nomination for the stupid question of the day and just open the gates. And so it was really so embarrassing as a teenager. Yeah. And I look back now and I was like, oh, I actually have appreciated a lot of the icebreakers or confidence that he would um, embody in mm. some of those conversations. Um, and my mom was a, a software teacher. So she would teach people how to use computers. And she was really uh, quite talented in that department. And she changed roles quite a bit after the divorce. So she started working in, um, theater stage management she worked in events she worked in sales she kind of jumped around a lot and um she finally found her footing in uh in campground management so mm. working with summer camps and yeah. kid camps and um she absolutely loved it and i think it was there's an element to my mom where she's still so spunky Mm. And I think that those environments really allowed her to feel youthful and connected to, you know, the times. So as she aged, she wouldn't feel old. Right. You know, youthful, youthful yeah. heart. Yeah. Mm. Such a youthful heart. Yeah. yeah. Well, I see where you and Steph get your energy from then, probably. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. And Chad, you ended up um, in retail at Holtz before you mm -hmm. made your change into hospitality and restaurants. <laughs> I was, I needed a part-time job while I was in school. I actually started at Banana Republic on Bloor Street. Mm. And I don't brag about much, but I could sell Banana Republic clothing. <laughs> I believe it. I, I think that was the only thing you wore when I first met you. Oh, Not only thing, well, but like, I mean, it was a majority of the it wardrobe. It was like, I don't know. It w like, I sold, I was one of the top salespeople per hour. I used to come in there and just like haul. And I got recruited by Holtz. Like, that's how much I developed such a reputation on Bloor Street <laughs> that they recruited me. Like, the manager, the women's sales um, manager, at Holtz like called me in and offered me a job. And so I was working in women's designer and it was hugely lucrative mm -hmm. um, because I was like this little 20 something year old gay kid selling the rich female Jewish population of Toronto, all their event wear. Right. So I was like a shoe in um, and I did that for the whole time that I was there. Mm -hmm. And I actually transferred back to Vancouver and transferred with Holtz. And I was in the Gucci department. And I transferred and quickly realized the two markets were very different. Mm. The Toronto market was, it literally was all the like Jewish society women um, who really appreciated who I was. To Vancouver, which was all Chinese, mm. which just has a different approach. Mm. Um, older Chinese ladies don't like working with young Filipino boys <laughs> the way that old Jewish ladies do. Mm. And at least that was my experience. And so I went from making like tons of money, super fast pace. My client bookings were always full to the old Holtz where it was like, I don't know if you remember, oh, yeah, remember. that hallway with the mm -hmm. little boutiques. Mm -hmm. I would just sit in my boutique and like stare at the wall. Mm. And because that store was, it was quite intimidating. Yeah. Because you had, it was not a lot of physical space. And if you were going to walk into one of those boutiques, you like really needed to know you could afford this mm -hmm. stuff. So there's no traffic. Right. And the only people that were coming in already had a personal shopper. So it was just a totally different world. And while I was kind of doing auditions and trying to figure out what was next, um, I quickly learned that Vancouverites don't shop the way they do in Toronto. 
but they eat. And mm. my brother was at the time, he was playing squash with the original um, opening chef of Feeney's. Mm. And mm-hmm. they were looking for people. But it was like red, it had just opened and everyone was sort of hired. And my brother was like, I guess I could get you an in, but you'd have to like lie that you know this guy. And I mean, I would never lie. Like back in those days, especially. <laughs> it's like so, I was such a rule follower. Um, but I did it. I lied. And I, and I was just talking about a hosting job. Like I wasn't talking anything serious. But I'd already been in Vancouver for like a year and change. And so the original manager threw me on the door at Feeney's. And in the first like three days, I knew almost like so many of the clientele because they were all regulars at Holtz. Mm-hmm. Oh. Like, and even though they didn't shop with me, like I knew yeah. all the ladies. Yes, and like yes. the ladies who were shopping at Holtz were, were eating at Lumiere and Feeney's. Yes. So ladies just, who lunch. Like, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So the manager was like, didn't, what's, what's happening here? <laughs> and I started as a host and I did that for however, a few months. And they were like, do you want to do more? But I was really dedicated to being an artist and, I was doing like the King and I and Tuts and I was doing, I had a one man show on Davy street. No way. It was basically me getting drunk with a microphone and a band, which for the record is an incredible experience. <laughs> oh, I, I have I bet definitely it is. experienced. Like I was given, they could barely pay me. I think I got like a hundred bucks, but an open bar tab. So <laughs> it was, a, I can just, and I mean, we're only talking like maybe 20 or 30 people on a good night would come in on a Wednesday night to listen to me just belt and get hammered. So it was like a quasi, but I was doing it every week. Mm. It was actually one of the most um, important developmental, like learning how to present myself and learning who I was as a musician and an artist uh, was, was a really important time to be doing that. But I was doing all these things and Feeney's kept saying like, you need to do more, you need to do more. Uh, and then I finally was like this, I got tired of the idea of the industry of music. Like I love music and performing, but I just wasn't cut out at least at that age for the process of getting there, of fitting a role. Mm. I also found um, I would go to auditions, especially in the musical theater realm. And it would be like me and a bunch of white guys, me and a bunch of black guys, like there's not a lot of stories out there for Filipinos mm. or it was always like Latino, but it was always something supporting. I could sing roles, but I never looked the part. Right. Um, I've pretty much looked exactly like this for about the last 20 years. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And I quickly realized that if I, the traditional pathways weren't going to get me anywhere. Yeah. So that was when I sort of said, okay, I'll give this restaurant thing a try. And I went from being a host straight into being a manager, and I was running Feeney's um, until I left for the UK. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. And is I'm just curious. I do you do you feel really really alive when you meet and connect with people? Is that like that? Is that what gives you lots of energy for in sure. life? The social yeah. energy, um, like running a restaurant floor, mm-hmm. is arguably one of the things that lights me up the most. Yeah. And I, and I think back to those days and you know, what made me successful wasn't the fact that I could carry any, like carry a tray or I wasn't particularly passionate about food or wine at the time, Mm -hmm. but it was the human experience. And I I think back to the connections of the folks that I made, especially at Feeney's because I was on the door. I was being robbed. (laughs) Like I was making no money, Mm -hmm. but I was working because I loved it so much, 14 hours a day, uh, six, sometimes seven days a week. Yeah. Um, and I was just on that door. And at the time, that restaurant was so busy. Mm-hmm. And many of the clients that I knew then are still, will go anywhere I go or I'm friends with now still. Yeah. It's so, so incredible. It's mm-hmm. like very relationship driven. Well, and you impact people. And I think yeah. when you are good at hospitality. Yeah especially as you get into the higher end, because I did a few, I would kind of sometimes go over to Lumiere, but you're 
when people are coming in to celebrate a moment in their life mm -hmm. and you're the person there, they never forget it. Mm. Whereas I'm lucky if I ever, like, I've seen so many people and it's embarrassing because people will come up and be like, oh my God, you were that guy at the restaurant on the, and we went for my birthday 15 years ago. Yeah. And I'm like, it's unbelievable the impact that you can make. Yeah. And it's something that I haven't taken for granted. Mm. And that, yeah. Of course, yeah. I, again, it's it's so relationship driven, and I'm curious to know too. Um, is a strength of yours? I remember reading this New York Times article about um, I forget the name of the restaurant in New York, but it's one of those power lunch places, and the ma the longtime maitre d um, was obviously he was personable, but he wasn't too over the top from the description of of this article. But he knew how to read that room. Like he knew everybody. He knew how to read the room. He knew how to seat people. And I remember thinking that was so, that is such an incredible skill because this power broker couldn't sit next to that person. And so it was kind of a game of chess on how and where he sat people 100%. in a room. Well, we, you know, my last big restaurant job was Hawksworth. Mm -hmm. And they're, call it like there's probably six tables in that room where you get all and we had all of the top professionals and they all had their favorite table mm -hmm. and there would be moments where th three of the top ceos would mm. all book on the same day and all expect their table and it's the same table mm. and so <laughs> you know taking ceos who you know all of them mm -hmm. and like w i've seen them argue because I would give it to one mm -hmm. and I'd explain to the other and they would be okay and they would go and sit somewhere else but then they would go over to the table and like call out the one that's sitting there being like you're sitting in my table yeah I can and imagine it, this you know and then I've had moments where I'd have to go and politely tell someone and their date that their wife is on their way in oh no yeah yeah and they know all the emergency exits <laughs> Like it's such an orchestration and you have to have so much patience to deal with personalities like that. And that's I think that's like my wheelhouse. Mm, mm -hmm. I used to like the tougher the client, mm -hmm. I, like the more mad they are, the better. Like give them to me. <laughs> yeah. And it it, be, it it became um I identified really quickly that that was something that I really learned how to do was to um somehow tap into the root mm. and I could confidently say I could diffuse almost anything. I mean, the stories you were sharing when you were a young kid, you just, you knew how to handle things even I, then. Yeah. And I don't know where it comes from, <laughs> but it, uh, reading the energy of a person and a space. Yeah. And the reason I, I realized that I also had to figure out what it was that made it work because if I didn't I would have to do it myself mm. Mm -hmm. forever because I learned I was like oh I could be that major d who's on the door of this restaurant for 50 years drinks way too much probably has a cocaine habit like but is like magic on the floor right and, yep. and everybody wants you to be there all the time and I was like you know I, can't, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life, even though I enjoy it. So I, I, I learned that I would have to try to figure out what it is, identify it, and learn how to teach it to people. Mm. And that was kind of my mission, was taking young managers and be like, it's not just about you know taking reservations and sitting people down. Yeah. That's, not, you, why, that's not why people go to restaurants. Totally. And then you ended up also learning about the operations of it and worked your way up that way as well. Well, yeah. And then mm -hmm. you just, you know, I just have an operational mind yeah. and you just, I got, David was incredible, David Hawksworth. And like he really gave me an, an incredible experience Yeah, to be able to take that business and run with it with them. And we had, we had a blast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, Really curious to know, um, because I mean, you, you'd been in the, the industry for so long and 
know, worked your way up and learned the ins and outs of it. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the show Hot Ones, um, where the host, Sean Evans, he has, he does, it's, it's incredible. He basically has celebrities, um, he interviews celebrities, and they eat hot wings that progressively get hotter throughout the interview. And I think it's brilliant because the hot sauce ends up being the great equalizer because when he's asking questions and they're just like, they can't breathe. They, they can't. They there's no there's no there's no mask, right. you know. And so they end up being like very honest <laughs> uh, about things. But anyways, they had David Chang hmm. on. He had David Chang on recently, and one of the first questions that came up was the future of restaurants, and he was talking about how AI is coming in food becoming more efficient. And so I was curious to get your thoughts on what you think on about the future of restaurants, having been in fine dining, and what that experience is going to look like. Well, I think that um, I've been saying it for years that, I mean, the model is so broken. It always has been. When you start to dig into the history of how restaurants were even run, mm. I'll call it in the new world, or it, it it's all based around servitude and slavery and people not being paid and and it's evolved into this thing that's built on a model where the business isn't sustainable. Mm. The amount that people think they should pay in a restaurant is just wrong. Uh, you know, people go to diners and restaurants and they expect to like have a meal that's quote unquote reasonably priced that they can get quickly and that they don't have to prepare themselves, they don't have to clean up. And when you consider all those factors, of, and I'm supposed to pay under $10 for it, like where's the math? That somebody has to, someone's paying for it somehow. Mm. And and right now as it stands, it's the servers and the cooks, and ultimately the owners too, because I mean nobody's making money in restaurants these days. Yeah. But I think that um, once upon a time, restaurants were only for the rich and they were only for um like special occasions mm. because i think we've developed this whole middle range restaurant that i just don't think unless you're ca like cactus or earls or one of the big chains the financial model just doesn't make it yeah sense. hard to survive if you're in that. so yeah i think that because when you get into the high end the people coming in will pay whatever because they know that they're going to get a world-class experience and they know they're going to spend a lot of money and, you know, even there, the margins are rough. Mm -hmm. But I, I really believe that the human interaction is going to be the commodity. Yeah, that's and, not going to go away. You know, because the, the technology is coming in and what have you and like quick serve, you know, the world is getting more and more casual and you can just cut, you know, you do, you cut out a lot of people mm -hmm. in order to get the product. But quite frankly, like, cutting out the service aspect of it on the lower end does actually allow for cooks potentially to make more money and potentially, you know, improves the bottom line. It's tough for the servers, but, you know, I'd say most servers in this day and age, um, and forgive all the servers that are listening to this, but, you know, they're often using it as a means to an end anyway. Mm. You know, and the pandemic was super interesting because it just wiped out a whole generation of servers yeah. and all those people who are sitting on the fence of like, oh, maybe I'm going to go back to school or maybe I'm going to, you know, actually. There's a, there's, there's a shortage right now, right? Oh, because well, because yeah. all the people who were on the fence and just like used to the tip money mm. suddenly lost that because mm. that they were all, they were all, they all had the golden handcuffs on. They were living the life, making a couple hundred bucks a night, free and clear cash, you know, and like the server life is pretty sweet. Yeah. You roll in there, you work maybe four or five hours in a good restaurant, you clear 250 bucks that you're not paying any tax on, you know, like, and you, you have your days free. And yeah. if you're working somewhere f like good, it's fun. It's a hugely social environment. And usually other servers are fun people too. Like, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a very addictive lifestyle and that's why people get trapped in it. Mm. Um, And so now that, you know, it's like wiped out. What you're left with is a really interesting sort of predicament in that I don't think there's enough staff 
to sustain all of it. So mm -hmm. you're going to start to see this culling. And my opinion is, is that we're going to be left with like super quick serve, probably still very good food, but with mm. like minimal service, all technology, fast, easy, inexpensive. Mm. Um, and then like the Supreme fine dining. Right. Um, because people will still want that. Well, I was just thinking that, oh, I hope that doesn't happen because there's like a, that that doesn't go away because there's such an artistry too yeah. when you go to these restaurants and have these experiences <clears throat> and what the, the chefs make it's it's art if anyone sees chef's table <laughs> you know yeah. it's it is oh, no it's, and i mean it's food is and essential art. right mm -hmm. and, and the expression and what it brings to mm -hmm. our lives i yeah. think is uh is so i i think like to make a, a city or a culture it's always built around food mm -hmm. you know art and food are oh, at yeah. the core so i don't you know it's not going to go away it, it's just it's got to evolve mm. i mean Unless we want a world f like the chain restaurants are doing a great job of providing a, a service because mm -hmm. it's fun and social and but like they're not cheap anymore. No. Like I still I remember when Cactus Club was like that place just off of Marine Drive with the peanut shells and the pepper, paper mache cows everywhere. What? Oh, my gosh. Like the original like we used to go there in high yeah. school and we'd use our fake IDs. Yeah. That and Margarita Mondays at Earl's. <laughs> um and th back then it was cheap. Yeah. It was inexpensive and they, they were a cool place to go. But And I still live in that space. But mm. I remember there was a time where you could actually get a cheaper meal at Hawksworth than you could at Cactus. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's so, so interesting. Well, I, I really, like I said, I hope the, the artistry does. I don't think it'll find go its away. And, and stay around. Well, the food is also such a big part of how we gather. A hundred percent. And yeah. whether that's around a dinner table in our own home mm -hmm. or elsewhere. Yeah. And I think that that component of gathering around food yeah. was amplified when we couldn't go out because then all of a sudden you're like, oh, these mealtimes became either really transactional because I'm now working around the clock mm -hmm. or many more hours than I, I have been. And it's just, you know, fuel. Yeah. But then making that point of being able to sit down with your bubble became like a cherished experience. Yeah, that quality time, yeah. break bread, talk about things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so as I think about, you know, the next generation of hospitality in the food industry, from, from my perspective, I actually see it as like, we're actually going to cherish it way more than just, I remember when Chad and I had uh, a local watering hole at the last place we lived at. We loved going to Nook and we would just go down because it was open and mm -hmm. we were too lazy to make dinner that night. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, do you want to go to a restaurant? Yeah. Like this is a moment for us this... versus like the thing you did because we were too lazy to do anything else. Yeah. But people are going out with a vengeance yeah. right now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, all of my restaurant tour friends are like, they're beating pre pandemic numbers. Yeah. Well, people just want to be around people, I yeah. think, is, is the thing. Yeah. And, and I totally agree with you about, you know, um, my friends and I, this is what we do. We go to restaurants or we have meals at each other's houses. And yeah. this is how we spend time now. I mean, you know, we're a little bit older now. And so, you know, we ain't clubbing no more. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no, no food is very, as we know, is is, is really um, crucial to family, friend, and cultural existence, really. Yeah. yeah. But for restaurants, I think that we have to find a way, people have to understand that if they're going to be served, mm. and like servers have to get paid, and so do chefs. Yeah. And so you've got to look at, it, it talks about like food supply, and like the misconceptions around how we get our food and the value yeah. of food. And it's, it's a whole huge cultural conversation. Mm. And so how do we still achieve that and make the actual business model work mm. is going to be the challenge. Hmm. Well, yeah, that would be fascinating to, to watch. Um, Matt, I'd love to talk about you and how you really like dived into leadership development. Mm. Um, and you started at Lululemon once you got to more the the professional side yeah. of your your life and career. 
that's where you started developing. Yeah, is there. I actually, it's so interesting because I graduated with a degree in HR, mm. and I actually have only spent a year and a half reporting into an HR leader um, in my career. So it's an interesting thing because I think that that's something that people know me for, know me yeah. as, is a people development aficionado. aficionado. <laughs> um, and so I started at Lululemon as a leadership development advisor. And this was the time when Lululemon was really starting to grow from a headcount perspective in Vancouver. It was kind of a sm- still a relatively small shop. And it was all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we are growing in a big way. We need to formalize our product strategy. We need to look at international markets. W- what do we do to bring great talent to Vancouver? And we were growing at a rate that was so quick that every other week we were able to hold an onboarding cohort of maybe five to 20 people every other week. Um, And so I was in this role of really supporting what is our foundational cultural piece? What what were our foundational cultural pieces? What were really important for new people to understand or experience? And we had a really formalized plan for people as they came in. And this was around the time when, you know, the founder was still walking the halls and, um, we were, we were experiencing tension between executive members of who had been there at the very beginning and who had just come in. And it was really interesting to be in charge of telling the corporate story or in charge of holding some of the cultural keys um, for new people to be able to have access to, you know, what does it mean to be at Lululemon um, during a time when it was like growing so rapidly mm-hmm. and we were kind of, I always looked back and I was like, it was, Lululemon was like a teenager when I, joined and so like our arm hair was starting to show and we had this like weird mustache and like one arm was growing faster than the other arm and all of that and it was so fun because what it taught me was how committed a group of people could be when they were aligned to vision and goals Mm. and what did that look like and when we introduced people to really creating a life that they would love to lead um, that was like their superpower And um, I was like a junkie after that. And one of the first goals that I ever wrote down in my onboarding, my own onboarding at Lululemon, um, was that I wanted to get my MBA. And I Mm -hmm. always had this dream of completing my MBA in Copenhagen. Um, I had done an exchange there previously in my undergrad, and I knew that if I wanted to get my master's, that's where I wanted to go my boss at the time and one of my colleagues actually wrote my letters of reference so here i am as a young professional within my first year of my job and my colleagues and supervisor are are writing me letters to say yes you should leave and not in a way of like we're we need to coach you out (laughs) you know more of like we want to support you Hmm. and your goals so while I was over in Copenhagen getting my master's, I stayed connected to our international expansion team and would jump over to London to support with some of the community building activities that were happening. I was there when we celebrated the first signing of the very first showroom of that was happening in Covent Gardens um, and got to really experience growing a brand from the ground up. When I graduate, when I graduated from my MBA, I reached back out to Lululemon to say, what's next? What's going on? They were like, well, we're looking at growing in Europe. So come back to Vancouver. We will get you really integrated into retail operations, high volume store management, and then we'll help you go back over to Europe. And at the time, we didn't know whether the head office was going to be in London or if it was going to be in Germany. Mm. So at the same time I was learning all these retail operations, I was sitting at my desk with a Duolingo account trying to learn German. <laughs> <laughs> and unsuccessfully, I will say. Tough language. Yeah, it's, it's just, beautiful, though. It just <laughs> didn't I learned it. land really? with me. <laughs> um, and at that point in time, while working on with the international strategy team, black stretchy pants became sheer. And mm. it was the big quality issue that Lululemon saw. It cost millions of dollars a day. Um, 
and they pulled international expansion. They stopped that strategy really to focus all the energy back into product. And they, um, some of the leadership team pulled me from uh, retail operations and put me into product quality mm. because I had an intimate connection with our stores and a big stakeholder was our store staff around the world. They didn't know who to trust. They were interacting with customers that were very unhappy and needed guidance and support and how to manage those conversations. And so I feel like I was there to stand back to back with our VP of product quality while she worked upstream with our factories and mills to fix the issue, while mm -hmm. I worked more downstream with our PR teams, our brand and marketing teams, our store staff to really manage the conflict. Right. And so I actually spent two years in product quality and to the tail end of my time at Lululemon, I got to be more involved in our new initiative delivery and mm. how do we take new product to market. And that was really exciting, but I quickly learned that I was being surrounded by experts who, just by touching a fabric, they would identify, oh, this was made in Northern China. This was made in Vietnam. That's and, incredible. And That's, the smart, wow. they were so smart. And I realized I, had, I didn't care at all about product mm. um, at the level that they did. Um, I was getting so far away from the people development side, so far away from really like developing organizational um, capacity and systems um, and really just kind of pigeonholing myself if I if I continued to go down this path my sister actually had started a recruiting company and she and I would do quarterly business reviews for <laughs> for her for her business and so one of them she was like can you finally like when are you gonna quit your job and come work here and so we created the Corker Collective um, which was, uh, or still is, a uh, HR consultancy company that focuses on helping people love every minute of their lives, even the tough yeah. ones. Yeah. And there's a recruiting arm, there's a coaching arm, as well as a, an arm that was created with manager training. Yeah, so the I, platform. Yeah. I did it actually. Oh, yeah, no like as a, um, for when I was at Rennie. Oh, yeah. yeah. Steph sent it to me and then wanted some feedback on it. So, yeah, yeah it was very cool to see that you were developing that and making that training as easy as possible through tech. Yeah, we wanted to create, we wanted to remove the excuse of why people managers weren't being developed. And I think with that, it was, um, we knew coming from in-house that the focus and who really impacted employee experience was your manager. Actually, Fasting, fast forward to like when I met Chad, I actually got so many messages from people when we first started dating. And they were like, Chad was the best manager I've ever worked with. <laughs> he changed my life, blah, 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 Chad, Chad, Chad. And it was one of those moments where I was like, oh, I've, I've nailed it in terms of who I am with because mm. our ethos around how we want to show up in the world, especially in the world of our careers, were so aligned. Um, so it was really cool to know that I had a great manager <laughs> in my partner, you know? I wasn't teaching totally. things that my man, my partner would be like, this is stupid, <laughs> you know? So quickly, how did you guys meet? It was at Dinner en Blanc. No way! Yeah. Of all things, because I was with Hawksworth, and mm -hmm. we were doing the VIP, ex we were doing like the food, yeah. the VIP experience. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And we I both was... have two different stories. Yeah, oh, I, know. I love because, this. Well, like my story was, was slightly fueled by a lot of white wine <laughs> and courage, and so, like, like liquid courage. Well, it wasn't. It was way past liquid courage. Yeah, okay. it was just sloppy at that point. No, I um, we landed that contract with the the guys who were running uh, Tyson and and Jordan and those guys. And we had like we did the food for that for Dino Blanc like every year. For many years and early on you know my role was to get everything set up and i was able to host a table as well mm. and so i kind of did double duty where i was like running the ops on the fnb side and i had one of those a table of 50 was pretty much all guys yeah um and we were just hanging out and I saw Matt and the other, the, this person that he just happened to be 
on a date with? I was on a date. Oh. I was with the I was with the pedestrians at ah. Dunea. I was and with they the were masses coming. that had and to schlep everything and <laughs> bring your own food. Dragging and, everything. Yeah, in a so cart. we offered that ex- the, the premium experience where you could pay more and you didn't have to bring anything. Yeah. We did it all for you. And the decor and was then already we had, set like, up. Big beautiful florals and da, 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 da. Mm. you want to hear a really weird fact? Sure. Is that as I was coming in, that person was standing downstairs. No way. No. I'm not even kidding you. <laughs> I was like, whoa, that's Vancouver's weird. Vancouver's very small. It's yeah. very small. So, well, that's serendipity. Yeah, and so, okay, in my mind, I saw him, and, like, they were they were both handsome guys, and I was like, who are they? I don't know them. Like, I should invite them over to our table and, like, come and say hi. And I did. And we exchanged, like... We exchanged information. This, no. <laughs> What's your story? <laughs> well, he's staring at me, so I'm just going to stop. <laughs> I go over, and we are just checking out the decor because it's amazing. It's so cool. We didn't know that there was this VIP experience. We literally thought other pedestrians were just going over the top. Then we get stopped, and Chad's like, what are you doing here? And we're like, oh, we're definitely crossed the line. We're, we're not in the right zone anymore. Mm-hmm. And we were chatting and I was like, oh, like, oh, I should introduce you to my friend, this person. And Chad's like, oh, well, let me introduce you to my friends. And so he brings us over to this table that he's hosting. And he's like, everyone, this is Matt. And their faces were just like blank stares. Like, why are, who is this yeah. person? And it was so awkward that my I don't think is, it was that awkward. It, it was like <laughs> my date is like pulling on my hand to be like, we got to get out of here. And Chad's like, well, you know, you should just stop by my restaurant. Like, just stop by for a drink. And I remember saying, I work at Lululemon. I wear shorts and flip flops to work. There is no way <laughs> I'm just going to swing by Hawksworth. Like, I'm going to go home, put on a suit <laughs> and then stop by for a drink. Like, very unlikely. Anyway, so Chad started following. He sent a friend request on Facebook. So exchanging details was more like Chad putting a friend (laughs) sliding into my DMs. And we actually didn't um, connect. So that was like August of the, in the summer. Yeah. And we didn't connect again until the following March where Chad was hosting an event for the TED conferences. Uh, in the Hotel Georgia, and my sister and I were actually going as attendees. Mm. And Steph and I had just completed some workouts that night. We were both really hungry, but we were like, oh, we're going to this dinner, so let's let's just have a quick bite to eat because, you know, you don't want to be hangry when appetizers are being served. Like, you want to be able to be social, yeah. not just like, where is the food? Yeah. <laughs> so we had a little bite to eat, and then we show up, or as we're leaving, I text send a message to Chad being like, oh, I'm actually going to be in your neighborhood. I said this would never happen, and now it's going to happen. So I'm coming to the Hotel Georgia. He said, no, this event is being sponsored by Hawksworth, as I can see on the invite. Are you going to be there? Mm. And in my head, I was like, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> I think your response was like, which one? We're hosting three or something. Yeah, we did. We had something. three that night, and I had no intention of going to any of them. Because I didn't need yep. to. But he was the draw. There we go. He was the draw. And so he was like, which one? There's three. And so I didn't respond because I was like, oh, you're busy. You have a busy night. So Steph and I go through. And then we realized that this this dinner was just a past canapes. It wasn't dinner at all. It was not dinner at all. We were like, we got duped. And so we uh, were just about to leave after the speeches. And in walks Chad from the back room. And I'm like, whoa, Steph, stand by. I'm just going to go and say hi to this person. So I go and say hi. And he asked the question, oh, where's your cute boy? I'm like, oh, I don't have a cute boy at home anymore. I was like, what about you? Like, why are you single? And he said, I just want to find a man, lock him down, and have a family. And usually that scares away all the cute boys. Mm. And I said, that only scares away the cute the boys that don't want that. He's like, I want that. So that doesn't scare me, scare me away. He's like, we should take – I should – take you out on a date then. I was like, that's a great idea. And that's when we actually exchanged information. Wow, I like this. And so Steph and I leave and we're like ravenous hungry now. (laughs) So she's like, this was horrible. We should go get food. And I was like, well, I don't know if it was like that horrible. I think I got a date out of it. (laughs) Yes. And I went down to see friends of mine 
afterwards. And I kid you not, I was like, you know what? I think I just asked my future husband out on a date. Oh, my gosh. The friends can prove it. Yeah. Yeah. It was the way he... knew. It was when I was... When I said, you know, the the kids and family is are scary. And he was like, it's only scary for the wrong guy, was the exact way you said it. Yeah. Mm. And just the way he said that, I was like, huh. So... On the same page. Yeah. This is... And it's one of those things. I think our story, when we talk to people about, you know who are dating or who are looking and they're like, Oh, I would never want to tell them. Like I would never want, I don't want to get married. Mm -hmm. Like I want that to come up in like date 10. I was like, why tell them right away. It's just the truth. Yeah. Like if you know it, if you're clear on what you want in your life, like tell more people that tell them right away because then you don't waste your time. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And I was single almost permanently. Like I didn't date. Mm. I just never wanted to. I, you know, like, and, you know, my Filipino mother was always like, are you going to die alone? <laughs> She's like, you're when in your you 30s. Get, get it together. What's wrong with you? <laughs> um, and so I just kind of got on this train of like, OK, if I'm going to date all the cards on the table mm. right from the get go, no time to waste. Right. Yeah. And so, look Because I happened. was what? I was like 34 or 35 when like, yeah, I yeah. wasn't young. Mm. So, no messing around. And now you have a family. And now you have a family. You have a baby. We've been together for born. almost eight years. Wow. Over eight years now. Yeah. And now you have Sasha. Yeah, little Sash. <laughs> How old is he now? He's a year and a bit. Oh my god. A year go- and a half. Yeah. A year, a year and, and a half. half? Yeah. yeah. I felt like you, I feel like you just had him like six months ago. It's so yeah. weird because now I'm seeing people for the first time yeah. as we reemerge in public. Yeah. And they're like, "Oh, how was your pandemic?" And here I am in like with a child in tow. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we grew this thing. Yeah. It's so fascinating. What was that journey like? I mean, I'm so green on on yeah. fertility and and how did you guys go about it? Was it a, a unknown donor or like how did this happen? We. I mean, we were very intentional every step of the way. Yeah. Uh, And I would say that we were like one step at a time. uh, And we really just used our networks, I would say. I was very reluctant to use social media and to like put the story out there because I thought it was personal and all this and that. And that was like, why? And so, you know, step one once we decided what we were going to do. And we evaluated all those options. So like mm. we talked about adoption, we talked about foster, we talked about, you know, would we, there's some people that would donate fertilized embryos yeah. so that they had gone through or were left over from their process. Would we want to create our own embryos? What would that look like? Does it need to be from one of us, both of us? Like we kind of had to be in, again, real talk right from yeah. the beginning. Matt calls it the choose your own adventure. Because there's so many ways you can go about it. Mm. Yeah, It's like a choose your own adventure book where you read the page and at the bottom of the page, there's two choices. And based on those two options, you then make your choice and you flip to the, that page in the book mm. and then you read the next piece. So a lot of it was like, OK, so we're going to choose surrogacy. We're going to choose getting a, an egg donor, ideally not from an agency. So mm. someone in our network would okay. be our egg donor. Um, we met with um, uh, a woman who's also a queer parent. And she and her wife had were very early in the game. Like they're, you know, when we started this conversation, she had, I think their daughter was like a 12 or 13. And so they, they had undergone their own version of the story, but really early when people weren't really doing it. So she started doing a little bit of sort of, like coaching for queer parents on the side Mm -hmm. and you know she had all these stories and all this advice but the the one thing that really resonated and was really ultimately I think what got us what we have today was she said never stop talking about it Mm -hmm. don't be shy Mm -hmm. introduce yourself and say hi I'm Chad I am I have a husband and I'm gay and I want to have babies know anybody Mm -hmm. (laughs) like And it was kind of you because you never know who's going to come to the table or or who. would know. And, you know, especially people. What I also learned through this process is that um, especially with mothers, when two men 
are yearning to have a child. Mm. I've found that mothers have stepped up in a way that I didn't know they could because yeah. they're the idea of not being able to have children genetically. Um, so it's been fascinating. Mm. Yeah, we were able to find our egg donor. Um, our egg donor was actually Chad's brother's nanny who was nice. working with our niece and nephew. Um, mm. And when she had overheard a conversation between Sean and his and his wife about, you know, we have to help Matt and Chad find an egg donor. She was like, well, if I could give these kids a cousin, I would totally do it. And, and so, she did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it was really amazing. And she, bless her soul, she moved out of the country shortly thereafter. And, yeah. you know, I we follow each other on Instagram. But she's like, that was my gift to you. I don't need to be involved. Wow. Doesn't want to be, like, have any type of relationship relational title yeah um and so that worked out really well for all parties um mm. that's what we wanted and then once we had successful embryos uh created we then posted on social media and chad to, as he mentioned was really reluctant he didn't want this to be a thing we posted about um and at the same time i was like give me one post i want to be able to ask for help and i know that our network like our surrogate isn't in our network, but our surrogate is one degree away. Like our network knows our surrogate. Mm. Um, and it was not even a week before we got our introduction to the woman who carried our first, carried Sasha. Wow. It was a friend of Chad's mm -hmm. and she actually is an incredible woman. We're so glad she's an aunt to our son. And she, um, had already been a surrogate twice before for another couple. So she So she knew the process. She knew and, the process yeah. and when she was done, so she would have she had one of her she had her own daughter and two other babies for a couple. And when she was done, she's like, listen, tell all your friends, like I'm not I'm not done. I want to keep doing this. Wow. And so she <laughs> I always say she got like ten out of ten Yelp reviews. We like did our background checks. We talked to the couple. We're like, were there any red flags, any issues that came up throughout these processes? and nothing came up. And so it actually was really interesting because at this point in time, we were kind of going on dates mm -hmm. with potential surrogates. But this is, again, we would start conversations around like, what's your view on abortion? What's your view on gay marriage? What role of, um, what role do you see playing in our family? Yeah. Like day one, it's like, nice to meet you. And here are the big things that we need to get mm -hmm. um, out of the way. And she was so easygoing. She was so clear on what she wanted which it made really easy because we were like obviously we want this experience to be enjoyable for her mm -hmm. um and then the pandemic happened so we actually weren't able to uh really be involved in the pro in the in the pregnancy in a more in-person fashion mm -hmm. there was some uh ultrasound appointments that i would just facetime into because i couldn't be there in person yes um and physical distance uh, she was based elsewhere in the lower mainland and so like luckily it was a local but at the same time s local didn't really matter in a pandemic mm. um, and I guess that's when trusting your surrogate is even more important because you weren't able to be there so you had to just trust nothing. that she was creating an environment for your child that she's carrying yeah that's peaceful yeah and I think there was an interesting moment where Chad was also like, we don't want to be those people who are like, are you eating salami? Like, are you, you know, singing before you go to bed to mm. our, you know, we didn't want to micromanage the situation because at this time she's, she's already done this twice before. This wasn't new to her. And she actually was the one to suggest to us to record ourselves reading stories so that she could put earphones, earphones on her <laughs> belly and get the baby used to hearing her voice. Wow. And so I went, yeah. I, I probably cried like 17 times trying to record like <laughs> Humpty Dumpty, <Of> course. <laughs> you know, just thinking I'm like, oh, this is the first time you're going to hear my voice. And mm -hmm. like she was such an incredible partner to us throughout this journey. And um, yeah, we have a lot of deep respect and, and mm -hmm. immense gratitude for our surrogate. Oh, yeah. I mean, sound is so important to mm -hmm. all beings. So that's what a great suggestion to yeah to have done that, the stories. Oh, 
Well, congratulations. I'm really, really happy for you guys Thanks. in this in this chapter. That's that's incredible. And you know, it's it's so cool to hear friends who are just doing it their way. A really good girlfriend of mine decided to have one on her own. Yeah. And she and she did. And the child is she's uh, four months old. And what a beautiful calm chill child and oh what you, a blessing it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> have are to in be the beginning yeah <laughs> <laughs> but they fool it's, you it's, in the first two weeks at least yeah. Sasha did. he was a gem was and he all a gem? of a sudden he like learned how to use his voice <laughs> we're like oh you will like, learn i like, need to sleep now you yeah have, like, but a then, true like, performer you know he was dying. a true performer yeah <laughs> yeah well yeah two two dads that are also performers in yeah. some way shape or form um with the theater and the music. Uh, I I digressed from your career journey. I actually had a question around, so you were at Lulu, then you went to Corker, and now you're at Smash and Tess yes. as COO. And my question is, um, what's the common thread between being someone who has, um, who is developing someone's leadership and being a good COO? It's really interesting because Ash, um, Ashley Freeborn, who's our CEO and founder, co-founder she um she said to me on multiple occasions it's quite rare to have such a people-focused COO um and it I I sit with that often because I reflect I'm like well I'm in charge of the operations of the business and there's no way we could ever run a successful business without taking care of our people Mm -hmm. so like to me it's almost like table stakes of course you have to care about your people um and I get that that's sometimes a rare perspective for a COO to have um the the thread to me is really about seeing how do we get up to really cool things together um, and and do that in a way that in, enlivens or makes people's lives better mm. in the process. So it's not just about being able to say we've achieved a goal together and like look at us at how good we are, but we brought a community or we brought, we, we bettered the lives of those around us mm. um, in the process. Mm-hmm. And I definitely saw that in Lululemon, in Quarter Co. That was our day to day. And with Smash and Tess, there's this unique opportunity to have a product be an access point for people to feel safe and loved and confident in who they are, both from a physical ex- appearance perspective, but also in terms of like what they're capable of doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so we talk about really existing to empower women to live really big lives with ease and confidence and so we think about that from a product perspective and we think about that from our own internal staff perspective and how we show up and give back to the community and so that's kind of been like a a, a consistent red thread in my career yeah Um, and I just I I could never imagine doing business like air quotes like be working without developing leaders in the world of course because these people your team they're they're carrying the the torch right? oh my gosh i couldn't yeah. t- like we are on a rocket ship right now i know you guys are growing crazy fast it's and you guys amazing. seem to have like a very loyal following like people who love smash and test love it yes and what's interesting it's like i would talk about oh i just you know joined the smash and test team and a lot of my friends would be like who what what mm. is that like who, who is that a like what kind of brand what do you do they didn't really know but then their wives or girlfriend would be like oh my gosh i have seven rompers (laughs) in my closet and so it was this really interesting thing where it's like if you knew you knew if you know you know yeah (laughs) and so it's been really cool to see how we're going to continue to evolve with our community because our community is evolving and they want different things to help them live those big lives Mm. um but the the cult following is real. Yeah, no, it's real. And we're so thankful. They like they actually have been uh, one of the reasons why we are so size inclusive. Mm-hmm. They like our customer base said, you know, I want to see this in bigger sizes and smaller sizes, and so it's almost like we have this unique opportunity to be a petite brand, a maternity brand, a plus size brand, a fashion brand without ever saying that Mm -hmm. in our branding. It's just like, we're here for you. Yeah. And And you will take many different shapes and sizes and stages of your life. And we're here for you. 
Ah, oh, I love that stage of, of your life, and you'll always have yeah. your romper. You got it. We'll <laughs> grow and shrink with you. Yeah. That's so cool. Is there any, I think, is there a, a new collabo that dropped recently? I mean, we just launched Hillary Duff Yes. Today. Okay, that's what I saw today. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I need to mention this. I think I saw it on the instas. Yeah, we yeah. did. You know, Hillary um, has, was an incredible collaborator with mm-hmm. us earlier this year, and we launched an entire collection. Mm. Um, and it was really cool to see how we could partner with someone who was actually – there were so many people both in our community and internally that were like, I grew up with Lizzie McGuire. And, totally. You know, like yeah. it was really cool to know that – our community ha- includes Hillary Duff. Yeah. So people could really feel like one degree away mm. from someone they looked up to or followed in their life. And Hillary um, and Ash worked really closely on, you know, what's the what's what's the gear for New Year's Eve? Yeah. What's the thing that will make people feel super special, especially now that some people will be able to gather together again and go to, maybe, go to maybe a house party or go to their favorite restaurant. Yeah. So it was cool to bring back Hillary for a New Year's Eve lunch. That's so cool. Yeah. Congrats. And everyone else, make sure you check out Smash and Tess yeah. on the products. <laughs> Just a couple more questions for you guys. I love it. Um, actually, I do have one more for you, Matt. Um, I was looking at your website, and I don't know how old it is, but you describe yourself as courageously creative. Hmm. And I just want to know, what does that mean to you? And yes, yeah, what does that mean to live life that way? A book that really changed my life was Stephen Pressfield's The War on Art. And after finishing that book, he essentially, well, in the book, he essentially describes the resistance we feel when we want to do something creative, whether that's cooking, writing a book, painting a picture, singing a song, creating a business plan for a business that we've always dreamed about. Whatever requires a little bit of us, like a little self-expression needs to be externalized. Um, And how to deal with that resistance. And it's after reading that book that I was like, I can't not write my first book. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't just know all this information about how to conquer resistance and not do something with it. Mm. And I then look at goals that I've set or um, different experiences like joining an adult hip hop dance crew, where I'm like, I love making a fool of myself. But I, 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 I say making a fool of myself, but really it's like I want to express myself creatively and I recognize that at this stage of life and this stage of my career, like there's a lot of pressures that my, myself and my peers would experience to be perfect mm-hmm. or to have it all together or to not look too improfessional or, um, or unprofessional or, you know, just fit into the box. Mm. And for me... I'm really proud of the amount of courage that I have been able to cultivate. And I would say a big part of that is, you know, having such an incredible relationship to support me and be a foundation that I can lean back onto. Um, Because then it means that I'm in more honest conversations with myself and others. I'm able to do different extracurricular activities that I may have said, oh, it's not important to me. But, you know, Chad will be like, if you don't go to dance class this week, like you aren't going to be a happy you're the happiest version of yourself you know Mm. so I call myself courageously creative but I definitely have to give credit to the man to my right well you just answered my next question which was (laughs) going to be yeah what is how does Chad make you a better person and then vice versa in every way possible what's that in every way possible I'm responsible (laughs) for all of it (laughs) and we're done (laughs) yeah Matt, your answer is. <laughs> <laughs> so is it my turn? Yeah, now it's your turn because he, he just shared. You know, um, I laughed when Matt started talking about goals um, because when when we first met, the word goals was like kryptonite. I work in the restaurant industry, and one of the things – about restaurants is that it's all in the moment. We are, people who are successful in restaurants are like really good at thinking on their feet. They're in the moment, they're super present. 
But we're not looking past the next guest. And what I will say, they are also very good at being like, who do you need me to be? Mm. So it's like, I'm here to make sure that you have a great experience. So who do I need to be for you? Right. Not like, who? how do I want to show up? Mm. You know? Yeah, so. I, I have a room full of 100 people who all have expectations. And I'm here to be who you need to be to make this experience whole. Mm. And so the idea of being like, setting a goal um, was not a thing. And when I think about, you know, Chad pre-Matt, um, it's it's like I'm unrecognizable. He's like slowly chipped away at me. <laughs> Faith and patience yes. are two things that I hold very dear to my heart. Like he got me to do Landmark. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I got him to wear sweatpants outside of the house. Like that is, you know, for the man who took three piece suit selfies in the Hawksworth bathroom all the time. (laughs) Every time he wears sweatpants now, I'm like, yeah, I I got that. (laughs) Well, because he knows that once he gets me to do something, I go like all in. Mm. (laughs) And so he got me to do Landmark. And then I did like the entire curriculum in one year. Um, I was like, I just wanted you to do the first one. Like I. What, what do you, he's now done more landmark than you. <laughs> By a long shot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, the thing that I've grown to love about Matt that I was, like, not sure about at first was, you know, what you see is what you get. And when Matt says something, that's what he means. Mm-hmm. Whereas I was like, well, clearly there's some sort of, like, back meaning to this or there's innuendo or there's subtext or and he just doesn't exist in that space he's like i'm going to tell you exact and uh i i've learned the value in and how we've learned to communicate to one another mm. um early on in our dating career are you, talk, <laughs> are you going to talk about the rating scale? Yes, go. Yeah. Well, because we both had very busy social calendars. We and I would always have expectations. Like, see, I would buy tickets to something and I thought I was being really nice and I would buy two tickets and I wouldn't consult him. I wouldn't check the calendar. I wouldn't do any of those things. But then he'd be upset when he couldn't come mm. because I thought I was being so generous and you're not going to move things around. He's like, no, I have a commitment. And I didn't understand the word of commitment either. Commitment, goals, those type, they were not for me. <laughs> and, but I was generous. Mm. Uh, but what I learned was it's so easy to just, we have a level of honesty and we created this scale. So if I had an event to go to, we get to rate it one to 10. One was you're not allowed to come. One's like, I don't even want to yeah. go. Yeah. One is like, <laughs> I'm going out of pure obligation. And 10 is like a non-negotiable, mm. you're coming. And then if you're anywhere around a five, you're kind of like lobbying a choice to the person. And you have to live with, if you're like higher than five, it means like you're coming. Mm. You know, it's good for you. And anything lower is like, I genuinely don't care. And it kind of represents how it was like the foundation on how we just learned how to communicate. Because you, we never have to, I never have to guess. Mm. I can, when it's good and especially most importantly when it's bad, it's like, I'm really angry with you right now, or I'm really upset with the situation, or I really don't want to have these conversations. And what Matt, one time when, you know, we were arguing and I was probably wrong and he was right, (laughs) um, he would be like, no matter what, I'm going to choose you. And so any argument that we have or anything that I say is in an effort to ensure that we remain together mm-hmm. and that when we fight, it's in the context of remaining together. And the idea of, you know, when couples fight, it's like the idea of I'm going to leave you or there are these like idea of a deal breaker. I know that that's not ever going to be on the table. Because we are completely in choice. And it's safe. Yeah. It creates a whole other realm, mm. right? Like, I, you access this space as a couple Yeah, that really allows you to once again connect with who you are. Because I don't feel like I have to fight for our relationship because we protect it so wholly and we protect what we have. And I've 
really done a lot of work and I've come a really long way. And, you know, because I would have considered myself super jealous and I had like a lot of emotional baggage that I was rooted in my own insecurity. But Matt has brought such grounding to the way that I am mm. that I'm comfortable enough to get fat. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm wear like sweatpants. Half kidding. In- I'm wear sweatpants in public and just not give a damn. <laughs> Completely that's, let myself go. That's I'm like, love. you chose this bitch. No. Um, <laughs> I'm that's pandemic. I'm talking pandemic weight. No, I'm just kidding. We're but it's it's like my husband is a gift. Mm, and anybody who interacts with him knows that. And so we he really taught me too the, the idea that love really is a choice. Like mm. love isn't this romantic, like I'm not getting, you know, I do get butterflies, but like it's that romantic notion that you're going to have that elated, that elation every day. And it's this fantasy. That's not life. Um, but when you choose it, when you choose him and you choose where you are, th- I know that I could never fall out of love. I would choose to stop loving him, but that's a totally different conversation. Hmm. Right. And so that foundation that he has helped create in my life has allowed me to, yeah, really get reconnected, I think is, Mm. you know, and there's just a grounding and we get to be ourselves in the context of this really safe space. Ah, that's so beautiful. I would add in terms of seeing, you know, Chad spoke earlier about the, 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 the loving support from his family and you know even though you moved to Montreal and later London you were really able to stay connected to this really core group of friends Mm -hmm. here in Vancouver um, that he went to high school with and the idea of like I am here to become a hub of community and welcome more people in and embrace and and create opportunities for more people to connect and more people to get to know each other I think has been such a delight because I always loved hosting Mm -hmm. yet never with the level of intention of like when you come over you are going to feel like the most important person in our life Mm -hmm. and I think that that has allowed me to really prioritize relationships in a way that I hadn't before they were like oh yeah, like I know a lot of people, but now, and over the years of knowing Chad, it's like, and and now I want you to know me in a way that is more than just surface. I want you to know my struggles and my joys, and I want to know the same of you, and we're going to come together in spaces that are beautiful or chaotic or whatever it is, but you're going to be part of this amazing community, and we want you to feel that love. Mm. That's so lovely. Yeah, you both really see each other. That's really cool. He's okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drunk all the time. <laughs> and he's so funny. And you're so funny. <laughs> I tell him that he's so funny. He's like, are you making fun of me again? I was like, no, I'm actually laughing at he your He laughs jokes. at me all the yeah. time. Because you're I... funny. <laughs> Just two more questions for you guys. Um, with Sasha, if he ever you know, in his older, as, as he gets older, ever came home and said, you know, I have two dads, but my friend has a dad and a mom. What would you tell him about, how would you navigate that conversation with him? I think him? it's so funny because- Like you're so lucky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we actually, when we were getting gifts from friends who would like provide books, it was very, cute to see how many people were very mindful of like this book is like two my like my two dads and me and Mm -hmm. like very mindful of like diversity and whatnot and then one of my friends gave me these amazing books but she texted me right after she's like oh my gosh I just realized it's like a mother and father and we're like that's okay because other people have like that's our version of the diversity Mm. you know like our kid is going to know queer parenting and they're going to know they're going to have really good relationships with other queer parents or queer families um and there's straight people in the world and so for us it would just be navigating a conversation like 
well, every family looks different. Some people have two parents, some have one, mm. some grow up with their grandparents, some are fostered and have, they don't have biologically related siblings. Mm -hmm. Like this is the way families look and every family looks different. Yeah. And what's interesting is I think kids are quite resilient. They like get it in a way that adults can sometimes be like, well, that's not a real family. <laughs> and you're like, well, like kids don't have that same preconception, I think. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And I really want to create a world where it just doesn't matter. I think there's, I, I don't know when the, the human race is going to get to a point where we just allow people to be and that people can be however they want. And it really has no impact on how we are. And so, you know, I mean, I've been on the board of directors for an organization called Out on Screen. They do the Vancouver International Queer Film Festival and run um, out in schools. So I'm in a lot of really big conversations around the queer space and um, identity and gender. And it's, I've just come to my own little conclusion that if we just let people do them, the world would be a better place. Mm. And my one wish for Sasha is that he's, you know, like, no one's like you. No one is going to have the same version of life that you do. And it's all okay. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, people have all kinds of parents. I mean, I know kids that have a parent who is genderqueer or a parent who used to be a man and now identifies as a woman and like all of these things. And, you know, like, but it's all okay. Yeah. Because they're all humans just trying to get through and just do the best version of their own life. And we're going to be a household where we welcome it all. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, in in more reflection on that, because we've said that often, and it's one of something that really grounds us in, in our parenting, I, I also realize, like, that's also a very vulnerable spot for a lot of people as well, to know that, like, we don't actually care how you show up, or we don't care who you are, all that matters is how you show up. Like, are you kind? Are you nice? Are you able to be um, honest? Mm. Are you able to be um, generous? Like, these are those things where we're like, those matter. And then however you label yourself or your relationship or your socioeconomics, like, cool. Like, relationship matters way more. Yeah. yeah. Are you a good human? Yeah. Yeah, at the I, end of the day. I know this is going to take too long. I have one, a really interesting thing that, um, I've experienced. Mm -hmm. I have. Uh, I know some parents who have actively chosen to not gender their child. So they have a little baby. Nobody knows what is between the baby's legs, mm -hmm. and like sit with that for a second. And when they came over to visit, they kept referring to them. They, the baby as they uh, or the baby or the little one and I was very conscious of the fact they've never said we're not gendering the baby but they've never gendered the baby mm. and I just sat there being like I was so resist I was just I wanted to be like is it a boy or a girl like societally and culturally and all like we hang so much on what is like what we can identify with and my urge, and like I, I was so resistant to it. It was a fascinating thing to sit with. Ultimately, you know, it's, it's, we as a culture, it's like we have a right to be able to define people, mm. and we did def we define them by what we can see and what we can hold on to. And if it doesn't fit what I understand, then it's obviously not right or good or it shouldn't be. So it was. It's been. It was very like humbling to realize how complicit I am in so many of the societal pressures that exist. Mm -hmm. And that just as simple as it doesn't matter what gender my child is or what sex my child is, we're gonna allow them to be, and how they parent them is how they parent them, but they love them just the same. They have you know, a roof over their head, they have clothing, they have a loving environment. But I just, it's something to really sit with. That, like, what are we imposing? On our kids yeah what are we what are we teaching them without even knowing we're teaching them that mm -hmm. and in our own process we 
of becoming parents, we had to meet with a, a therapist who essentially just made sure that we were of sound mind going into this. Mm-hmm. Um, and she kind of, she coached us through, you know, how, how do you want to tell Sasha about how he was created and what are different options with that? And, and we chose this, the path of, well, we're going to tell you everything. We're going to tell you it all. And it was interesting because they said that they, Sasha would likely want to know about his surrogate first because he would identify as like, oh, I was in someone's tummy. Like where, whose tummy was I in before actually understanding that genetics are different than like Mm. the oven in which you were baked. And so there's this piece of like, we don't, we, we have to be so transparent or, or for me, I'm like, oh, I have to, practice being so transparent about relationships and how people live their lives in a way that doesn't make our surrogate or our egg donor feel any less than important Mm -hmm. in Sasha's life. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I look at other families or other people, it's like, how do we just make sure that you don't feel less than like, and, you know, other people may have been exposed to born into situations and circumstances where they've been consistently called less than Hmm. um and so for us it's like we don't care and Hmm. we just want you to be a part of our life in a really meaningful way Hmm. yeah i think this is a nice segue into my last conversation my last question not last conversation (laughs) last question this is the question i ask every single guest and i'll leave it up to you guys whether you want to answer it together or answer it Separately, I have a little sidebar, a little hush. hush <laughs> yeah, I'll let you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just I'll, I'll give you some time. Um, the question I ask is, with what you do, what do you want to leave behind in the world? I mean, what's interesting about like the idea of asking someone like what you do, super triggering for me right now. Mm. <laughs> no, I'm a stay-at-home dad, and um, I would want to leave behind children or a child whatever however many we have um who understand their worth and who can move through the world in their truest and most honest form and feel they're like their best self Mm. you know like grounded happy, well-adjusted kids who can then potentially do the same. Mm. I love that. Matt? It's so funny because as soon as you said, you know, super triggering with what I do, I was like, oh, I actually have a very similar answer, but we do very different things from a professional standpoint. Um, to, If I was to put it in my words, the difference that I want to make is to give people opportunities to see themselves in their role models. Um, And I think for me, when I look back, um, I didn't have those people that I could identify with as people who were successful and whatever that meant to me at that time and were happy or had a life that was exemplary. And I think you know, everything Chad said, underlined, highlight, exclamation marked. <laughs> and I would want to make sure that it's not just that they they have this own, their own confidence, but they live in a world where they see that confidence in other people that may not have been represented before. Um, and so they know that they're part of a community of people that have that understand, that deep-seated uh, self-worth. Mm-hmm. that deep-seated confidence in who they are and what they bring to the table. Um, and I want to be part of creating that community. Mm. Well, Chad, you called Matt a gift, and I'd like to say I call you both a gift. So thank you so much for sharing your stories, spending time with me, sharing your thoughts. Yeah, this time was a gift to me. So You're a gift, I, <laughs> May. This was so nice. Yes, it was really nice. And I hope to do this again, even offline. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. If you enjoyed that last conversation, 
be sure to check out more episodes with Craft on Spotify and guest photo galleries on the website at wearethecraft.com. Thanks again for listening.